Welcome to the dark forest. Jackie and her pals will never bore us. Shameless confessions about our obsession will make us laugh and smile. So let's explore the dark forest and dark down for a while. Hey, it's Jackie Cation. Welcome to the Dork Forest. You know the websites, JackieCation.com, DorkForest.com, TheDorkForest.com. If you like a determiner, Family Pet Ancestry, if you like that old joke. Yes, because it just goes to JackieCation.com. Let's do the credits. Mike Rickberg composed and sang that song you just heard. He sang it with his wife, Sarah Cohen. He will sing his version of the Mexican hat dance at the end of the program. Patrick Brady's going to fix this audio, and Vilmos fixes the website, JackieCation.com. On the websites, there are many ways to support the show. You can get merch, T-shirts, CDs, a DVD, and um, hoodies. I have some hoodies in stock. The T-shirts are all union-made here in the United States. There's Ranger of the Dork Forest T-shirts. There's Logo T-shirts. And there's two stand-up T-shirts, Spooky Reading Girl and the Meat Shield T-shirt. The Meat Shield T-shirt is a charity T-shirt. All the benefits of that go to Black Lives Matter, the ACLU, and Southern Law Poverty Center. So if you order that shirt, know that I don't make any money on it. That just goes to a charity. And um, the new album, I Am Not the Hero of This Story, is available, like all the other albums and the CD, uh, hard copies on the merch page on JackieCation.com. You can also get everything digitally, and you can get my DVD streaming at ComedyFilmNerds.com. The Dork Forest is under the umbrella of AllThingsComedy.com, which is a podcast network with Al Madrigal and Bill Burr, and they have a lot of different podcasts over at AllThingsComedy.com if you want to listen to those. You could review the show on iTunes, and that supposedly does some good works. If you just want to donate to the show, there's a PayPal button. My Venmo is available. You can email me to ask me anything you'd like, Jackie at JackieCation.com. The PayPal has a new feature where you can donate monthly because someone just did. It's amazing. I recommend 10 bucks a month. That's what I recommend. Uh, but that's because I'm me and I would receive that $10. Uh, I use it wisely on audio cables for live shows and I occasionally pay a bill with it. So if you would like to support the show, just hit the PayPal button. If you don't have any money and you don't want any merch, you can do a passive way of helping out the show by using the Amazon banner. The Amazon banner and the Amazon link are on dorkforest.com and jackiecation.com. They just take you to the Amazon page. You order like normal, doesn't cost you extra, and good things, good times are had. Any other than that, you also on jackiecation.com, you can check out where I'm going to be doing stand-up comedy. It's February, so I'm doing Minnesota, Acme, my home club. I'm Valentine's Day. I'm in San Francisco at Cobbs, and... Then I'm going on a Joko cruise, nerd cruise, dork cruise, geek cruise with Jonathan Colton and his friends to Mexico. Joko cruise. That'll be super fun. I'm sure I'm missing out on something. Probably the premium episodes on Bandcamp and some other information. But let's get into the show. Hey, it's Jackie Cation. I'm in my living room with uh, Julie Seabaugh, you guys. And Julie Seabaugh, you are a full-time freelance comedy journalist. Yes, Jackie. Thank you for having me. It is actually the 15th anniversary of my being a professional comedy journalist. I started in January of 2003 after I graduated what? college. Where'd you graduate from? I went I might... to the University of Missouri. I, I actually grew up on a farm in Missouri about two With hours. aminals? There were some cows when I was little, apparently. Uh, my parents have a couple pictures of me <laughs> sitting on cows as a baby. Okay. Uh, mostly corn and soybeans okay. by the time I was grown. Did you did could you work a tractor? Did you I know? could if under duress I could work a tractor, I could work a dump truck if you needed me to bale some hay, skin a squirrel, uh catch skin a squirrel. fish. We had some fishing ponds, we had some rabbits. There was some outdoor action going on. There was, yeah. So you were raised on a working farm. Uh-huh. And then you were country folk. Oh yes, and then some. There were uh I, I never remember how many acres we have. I, I want to say still do, more. still oh, do. Yeah, uh, my brother's going to take it all over someday and turn it into a winery bed and breakfast, <laughs> <laughs> which is good because I don't want nothing to do with it. Right. The uh, it, it actually got a citation or award, whatever the proper terminology is uh, for being, citation. Sounds uh, like you got a ticket. <laughs> uh, there's a plaque. Oh, you got a plaque for being a Missouri Century Farm. It was my father's 
grandpa's farm. And he took it over from his grandpa. And now there's a plaque that it was in the family for over 100 years. Right, right. Go on to my brother. And uh, yeah. I and want wine and a bed and breakfast will ensue. Yes. Because your brother's I'll... like, I don't want to. He is uh, more attuned to the land. Oh, is he a guy that's attuned to the land? Yeah. Or Fair I, always, I always did the words, the books and the reading and the, and the writing sort of Welcome stuff. Welcome to the Dork Forest. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. <laughs> Uh, so we've met because I do stand-up comedy and you've written about me and I say to myself, hooray. So, uh, but we will go forward and talk about your dorkdom. I wish you had a book or something to plug, but people should just follow you and read all your stuff. Yeah. I'm actually for this month, uh, I'm normally just so terrible at self-promotion, but on social media, I've been posting one of my old stories every day. Right. And... Cause it's the 15th anniversary. So yeah. you're like, let's celebrate that. Yeah, there's no one else in the country doing freelance comedy journalism full time and making their full living from it. There's obviously people writing about it. Yeah, and there are. You but know, you're a grown up lady, uh, earning a living do- writing about comedy, quote unquote, on a lot of things in that description. <laughs> uh, right, certainly All no of that, money. A grain of salt. We're not saying that you're earning an amazing living. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've been scraping by for 15 years, proudly. It's, which is exactly like being a comic, kind of. I know, it's all... That's, Just think of it. You're living a parallel life of uh, a walking around uh, comic who's uh, shoveling sand against the tide. That's why I get along with them so much better than regular people. <laughs> uh, well, fantastic. Now, you have a hero, and we're going to talk about that hero as your dorkdom. Yes, uh, there is a lady named Martha Gellhorn. She Martha was Gellhorn. Uh, one of the, if not the, world's first female war correspondent. She, uh, I came How upon her. She? Oh, she's dead now. Okay. I came upon her uh, after graduating the University of Missouri. And right. Moving to New York about a week later in the dead of winter, driving U-Haul through the mountains of Pennsylvania. You're like... Through Times Square. I'm going to go from Missouri to New York now. Now. How about now? Right now. Well, when is there a better time? Eh, spring. Fall. Something. I was a little naive. Yeah. But aren't we all when we go to New York? I had such high hopes for journalism at that time. It was actually a thing at that point. Uh, 2003. Yes. It's still a thing. Don't, don't, uh, don't give up. Don't give up. That's a whole other conversation we could it's have true. all together. Well, we, we're going to talk about journalism to some extent because of this Gellhorn lady. Two L's. I would not have gone with that. G-E-L-L-H-O-R-N. Uh, I'm Martha. German. Much, okay. Uh, much like me. And, and that's only where the parallels begin. <laughs> um, so I'd moved to New York and I had my, my lifelong subscription was always to Entertainment Weekly. As a kid, my sure. first magazine, reading about the movies and the music and the <laughs> glitz and the glamour. Oh, cripes. When I had four channels and no cable right. back on the farm. Didn't even know what comedy was until college. And Let me ask, instead of Pokemon, did you watch Digimon? I did not. Uh, I do remember the Pokemon cartoon. Because that Pokemon time. was cable and Digimon was essentially the non cable child's version of Pokemon. Like, if you wanted to watch anime, that's as close as you could get. There were Power Rangers, there were Gargoyles, uh, Ninja Turtles. Sure. Uh, that made regular TV. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Anyway, so you're in New York. And uh, with my, you know, you're clutch- living the dream. Clutching my Entertainment Weekly subscription. <laughs> To my chest, uh, and I saw a little blurb in one of the issues for a book coming out about a female journalist Uh who traveled the world and was pretty badass. And I'm like, that looks really cool. I think I'm going to get that. So somehow I have, for the readers at home, uh, for the viewers at home, I'm uh, (laughs) holding up a a copy of this book here now, uh, Gellhorn, A 20th Century Life. I somehow got a Did you buy it? Did you buy it? I must have not because it is a advanced edition, not for sale. The back of it has, you know, has blurbs coming soon. So this is a, the possibly the second copy you have of this book. I probably was ent- uh, maybe not entirely ethical and said I wanted a review copy from somewhere. Sure. I can't remember exactly how I got my hand. Oh, actually, you know what? I might have been working at Book Magazine. I was an intern at Book Magazine. They might have had a review copy. Sure. That I stole. Uh, yeah, but the they need to be read. 
However, so. I got my hands on it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Through Entertainment Weekly, alerting me to its existence. I and it's a monster. This thing's a doorstop. Four hundred fifty pages. Dense, and, small print. Uh it's uh yeah, pretty small. Yeah, that's uh. Not is it the, a life? Is it an amazing life? Who the fuck is she? Well, okay. So I start reading this thing, and so she's born in 1908 in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm like, I'm from Missouri, too. <laughs> my goodness. Your life was, uh, oh, my God, that's hilarious. What are the odds? Uh, and uh, so even when she's young, she's always reading and writing, and she's not a typical girl. She's very tomboyish and independent and running around, and she was like, marching in these women's lib movements. Um, right. And I'm uh, like, oh, I, I I feel these things too. Let's read further. And she <laughs> just, as she's growing up as a teenager, she just did not give a shit about hurdles. And right. didn't let anybody tell her what to do. Yeah, yeah. Especially men. Uh, she knew early on she did not want kids. Right. Much like me. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. she just grows more badass from there. She's becoming an adult. She leaves Bryn Mawr College without graduating to move to Paris for two years. Uh, she starts reporting there. Then when the Depression hits in the 30s... Who's, who, who's bankrolling this? Any idea? She was already writing young. Okay. You know, so, making that meager freelance wage. Right, the meager monies. And mm-hmm. then she dashes off. Uh, like, she gets into Bryn Mawr. Yes. So... Her parents had been semi-wealthy. We did differ there. Uh, her, father <laughs> was, her father was a doctor. Uh, he did die when she was younger. Uh, that's something that did kind of affect her her whole life, seeking sure. approval from right. powerful men uh, in ways that were not you know, readily given. She wanted to earn people's respect. But she probably inherited an okay chunk of change uh, from her pop. And so she had a little bit of a bag roll. Because the thing is, is you don't get to go to Bryn Mawr, and then you don't get to go to Paris, unless you have a couple of shekels socked away. So She, she was writing already at that yeah, point, for sure. So, and her mother did live a long, 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 long time. Um, so I know her mother was probably using some of that money. She does of course. siblings also. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So, but, uh, but she goes to Paris. What year yes. is this? Uh, that would have been like in the late twenties at some point. Like she's 20 years old. She drops in out her, of college. Yeah. That's her, 28. twenties. Yeah. Um, the thirties is the depression hits, you know, she's like, well, my, my country's in peril. What can I do to help? And she goes back and travels all around the country during the depression, writing about poor people. Okay. Struggle, lack of food, lack of housing, lack of work. Uh, she becomes friends with Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Through her coverage, because it's right, right. so excellent. And so she's always hanging at the White House right. and telling them what's up with poor people. Right, right. Because Eleanor has them. always cared. Yeah. Because they had that thing that rich people have, which is noblesse oblige. And the Roosevelt's is, had it uh, in spades, man. They uh, That they did? Yeah. they were. The Roosevelt's were pretty good as far as like, they were like, we're super rich, but we should help the poor because there's potential there. Ah, uh, yeah. And, uh, and it's, a, it's an ancient, you know, it's the... It's the, uh, we're supposed to help the less fortunate. And it's a little patronizing, but then people get to eat and possibly education. It's also Christian. And I'll take it. Mm -hmm. I'll take it with a, with a, with a, and, and, and mock it slightly, but not entirely. (laughs) I mean, you know, they did start all the New Deal work programs and we got the national parks out of it and hooray. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but, so I'm surprised she did not go to Spain. I take it for the, the civil war. Well, this is coming up. Okay. This is this is right around the corner. Okay. So in 1936, she's in Key West with her widowed mother. Okay. And in a bar, because I guess they like to drink together, which is pretty cool. <laughs> well, good for them. And they run into Ernest Hemingway. Of course they do, because I was like, I was wondering, <laughs> Key West, why wouldn't they? Uh huh. Okay. It's either him or Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> Thank God. And uh, so they're hitting it off. At mm-hmm. the time, Hemingway is still married to his second wife, Pauline. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But they decide to run away to the Spanish Civil War together. Oh, interesting. And they're covering it from this hotel. I believe that it was called the Florida Hotel. La Florida, if I'm correct. Uh, that's getting kind of bombed constantly. It's always shaking. So they, they go to Barcelona together and they stay at a hotel called the Calf- the Florida? I believe that's was That's hilarious and confusing since Key West is in Florida. <laughs> okay. He might have got a discount. Who knows? <laughs> right. I'm from Florida. Do I get a discount? Here's my AAA card. So they're having their affair as he's still married and, 
you know, kind of by all accounts, this is where she really learned how to be a war correspondent. I don't want to say under his wing, but... It's what happened. Right. It, and the thing is, he probably introduced her to more trouble than, you know. And everybody freaking loves Hemingway. Yeah, he was already vastly popular at that time. Right. So, I mean, it's not like, it's it's just being adjacent to the Roosevelts and Hemingway. That will get you work. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's cronyism, but there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, and she was writing for tons of outlets. Mm -hmm. um, there was already a lot of, she had a resume. Yeah. It wasn't like he was people plus, can get plus you. wanting her. Right. Or and well people can get you work, but you they don't they can't keep your work. You have to keep the job and you have to make your own name in the job. But p other people hopefully will help you get a job. Maybe that's where the yeah, that, that money comes in if you're the rich the rich folk where, where, where some money <laughs> comes. Yeah, that can't hurt. Anyway. <laughs> so uh and then as World War Two is starting up, mm -hmm. uh she really, you know, gets out there and starts kicking ass. She's in Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hong Kong, Burma, Singapore. You know, just this is kind of her prime okay. of reporting. And yet at the same time, she still finds the time to go ahead and marry Hemingway in 1940. And she finds all by herself and sets up all by herself a house in Cuba. Okay. Uh, she was, like, digging ditches and stuff at one point and, like, pulling trees out of the ground. And yet she's still running all over the place. Right. Uh, kind of to the extent of his aggravation, he's – this is Hemingway we're talking about, obviously, and he's used to being the big star yeah. writer anywhere he goes. Right. And has a bit of ego. He likes to be fawned over. He likes to have a wife who – you know, I guess looks up to him in certain ways and he kind of started losing her respect over time as he got more of his own ass. Right, right, right. <laughs> With the boxing and the fishing and the submarines and stuff. So she, she kept doing her life. She kept living her life. And then they were married and he wasn't, he didn't feel like she had given up anything for him. Yeah, I guess. And so. One of the quotes was like, are you a right or are you my wife in my bed something horrible sounding like that <laughs> <clears throat> classic and, yeah he i guess expected her to become a little bit more domesticated which my girl's not gonna go for that no so and this is my favorite story so completely off the rails insane bonkers mm -hmm. uh, so she decides to you know d-day is coming up it's you know not d-day as we know now but there's Normandy. Progress. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 1944. Things are coming to a head. Yeah. She wants to cover it. Her big outlet at that point is Collier's Magazine. Okay. Uh, ladies Magazine, but, you know, that's where the bucks are. Uh, well, and she's a woman writing, so they're, and, and I'm sure, have you read her articles? Yeah. 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 Well, her angle, which I always appreciated, was uh, being a woman and obviously a trailblazing woman at that point in time as a journalist. A lot of men in power uh, did not take her seriously, or they worried for her safety, or they, you know, they were obviously not going to give her any preferential treatment. So they both worried for her safety and then did not help her. Congratulations, because they didn't want her there. Is what it was. This is this is we're 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 boys and we're playing war, and you shouldn't be here. But the, so that she is that where she wrote from? Yeah, I, she might be bleeding out of her whatever hoo ha. What, what was the quote? Uh, oh, oh, like she might. <laughs> oh, she might have her period, and then oh my god, the war is going to end while we look for a tampon yeah, for you. Give away their location. Guess what? They didn't have tampons back then. <laughs> so basically, she was not really allowed to the front as much. She would not get the official war reports. You know, the press conferences. She got shut out of a lot. So where the male journalists were writing about, we've gained 50 kilometers in a northwest direction, uh, she went out and she wrote about people. Okay. She visited with the people whose houses got destroyed and whose kids were killed and who didn't have any food and wrote about how war affected people. And this is what people oh. were reading back in the United States and internationally as well. It wasn't about, here are XYZ facts. Right, because she wasn't allowed to, she wasn't given the facts. So she, so she had out. to create the story herself. Yep. And so she wrote about 
the result she, like she did did she interview the soldiers or she interviewed the civilians or both both uh more civilians typically um, yeah because you know as a That's woman a powerful as a woman if she's talking with you know mothers mm-hmm. grandmothers mm-hmm. and those kind of people uh they're gonna be a bit more open mm-hmm. with her than some dude who's just like Give me quotes to make <laughs> right. my quota. Yeah, that yeah, sort yeah. of stuff. Right, right. Um, so that was what she was doing, which is so admirable. I, uh, the phrase, I believe, was uh, the face of war is what she okay. always tried to go for. Right, right. The actual effects of it. Yeah, yeah. And as Hemingway's getting annoyed with her for her constant running around, <laughs> uh, and she's getting ready to go uh, try and get covering at D-Day, for Collier's, Hemingway writes Collier's and says, hey, I'll cover this for you for Collier's. And they let him do it because he's Hemingway. Right. So she, he took the gig away. So she's scooped by her own douchey husband. Yeah, yeah. So what she does. Yeah. And this is the one that's, oh my gosh, the balls on this woman. She sneaks aboard a medical ship. Okay. Heading for the beach. Mm-hmm. Hides in a bathroom. And then when they land, she comes out and reports on it. Just shows up on the beach. She's wait. She with the landing troops. Yes, she was w- in because, a medical ship. In a medical ship because the the other the other journalists were probably allowed to go with the soldiers. And you also have to have press credentials and stay in this area until right it's because there's all that safe. the crazy ass footage of the of the landing. So clearly there were there were photographers yeah. and yeah. So she was like like one wave behind in the medical ship so that they can pick up the dead. And so she comes and covers it from that angle. Holy crap. Yeah. That's awesome. She was very much one of the very first reporters to set foot yeah. on shore. And yeah. she did it totally herself in this bonk. Like, think about it. You're on the dock. You're like looking at the ship. <laughs> right. And I think I might, uh, well, let's see. We'll give this a shot. <laughs> so I'm going to go and hide in this bathroom with my like one bag. <laughs> of reporting stuff and it right, wasn't my even, notebook yeah and a my, fresh pair of underwear maybe <laughs> if you're lucky all right i'm sure the toilet was a bucket this is not modern plumbing right well and it and it the weird thing is is that no one needed to use the toilet while on the trip but maybe there were more than one the more there was more than one head that's what they call it in the navy i uh yeah i read a lot anyway so i'm so, i'm uh, not entirely sure about the uh, the toilet facts the situation right the toilet facts were not recorded in her in her in her book uh i kind of want to know and she was like uh there's someone in here <laughs> for the whole for 14 hours <laughs> I'll be out in a minute. <laughs> so like she's... lowering her voice. <laughs> <coughs> Flush. <laughs> uh, uh, toilet stuff. Still always be funny. I'm not, not always, but <laughs> I'm sorry. Go. Glory hole? I don't know. And, um, so, and then she can't know what's happening out there. So it must just, you know, come up on the beach at some point and crash bump. Oh, right, right. And it's like, okay, I guess we're going to. I guess I'll sneak out. And there's all bombs and guns, and it's saving Private Ryan. Here we go. Right, right. Yeah. And so she was not killed. And, well, what I think is interesting is that Hemingway, I mean, she met him while he was married to someone else. She travels a lot, giving him the freedom to clearly screw around on her. Oh, yeah. yeah. She's like, I don't know why you would be mad. Because if I stayed here, you would just cheat on me in front of me. This way, knock yourself out. I'm going to go to Burma. I'll be right back. And then you get laid elsewhere. We'll get together when I get back, if you'd like. Yeah. And then you go get a taco and uh, some key lime pie and a beer, and I'll, I'll be back in a month. And, so, and, then, he, and then to be a, the biggest douchebag in the world and steal the gig, how long did they stay married? Hey, you guys, this episode of The Dork Forest has a sponsor, and it's Stamps.com. You've heard of Stamps.com. Stamps.com is a postage on-demand service. It's $15.99 a month, and you get to never go to the post office again. That's right. You can print on envelopes, labels, or plain paper, and they give you a free digital scale to make sure that you're doing it right. The digital scale, you pay shipping and handling. First four weeks, it's a trial. You get the the scale, and you get $55 in postage coupons to see if you want to do it. 
and you use the code JK for Jackie Cation, or just kidding, after four weeks, you decide whether you want to continue to do it. If you keep doing it, they charge you for that first month. Otherwise, you have to cancel before that fourth week. But the great thing about it is that if you go to the post office on a regular basis, you can save those trips. And also, because of the digital scale, you never overpay it. So if you want to do it, click on the microphone, use the code JK for Jackie Cation, and sign up for stamps.com. Let's get back into the show. Uh, a year. Another mirror then. after that? Yeah. 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 Well, he did actually start up with uh, who became his fourth wife, Mary, while he while they were still together. He is not a serial monogamist. <laughs> he is a guy that likes to have one in the chamber while he's shooting the bullet. That's a and terrible analogy. So, I'll be moving. Um, he also shot a lot of animals, too. So yeah, he was a big, he was a big coming guy. <clears throat> but um, he liked to uh, stab... Uh, have you read much Hemingway? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I actually uh, like his writing a lot. and I. What do you like about Hemingway? Uh, he's very succinct. He gets the point across in uh, as few words as possible, which is kind of the point of good editing. And what do you think about his point? He was very good. And it's, in some ways, it's kind of a paradox because he's also really good about showing how war affected people also. Mm-hmm. His largest oh, novels yeah, yeah. are just that. Right. You know, they're about soldiers or former soldiers or people who had their balls blown off and uh, who were shell-shocked and people whose wives die in battle and, you know, all, all that Hemingway stuff. Uh, he did it in a much broader scope, and it was all fiction, obviously. She right. did try to do some fiction. It was not as well-received. Uh, it was kind of a pipe dream of hers to be a good novelist. It just did you, didn't happen. Did you try to read that? Have you ever tried to read any of her fiction? I don't like it as much. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I, I definitely. So you did try, but it wasn't. But it wasn't very good for you. Yeah, it's um, always about these conflicted ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Again, probably nonfiction. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing about. It. I, I always read Hemingway, and I was like, "This isn't fiction. This is your attitude." toward these things and terrible things have happened around you and you are re- essentially telling us the story of those terrible things and you're just i i think he just made the story he he combined several stories that he heard i mean sometimes fiction is that you know i mean you're like i'm gonna take this story from when i was a kid and then pretend that this happened on top of it and then that's gonna be the story and for for me i i'm not a huge fan of Hemingway just because um i'm like Oh, you're killing me here, but uh, but the uh, but I read crap, so God knows I am not the one to um, to be the judge of people who love Hemingway. So I'm always I'm I'm always psyched to find out why people like what what resonates in a Hemingway uh, book for you. Well, I mean, he's obviously withstood the test of time for a reason. This is classic literature, right? Right. We're talking yeah. Yeah. About. One of the biggest novelists of all time. Right. But you know what? I didn't like the Scarlet Letter either. So <laughs> I got classics coming out of the ears, my ears that I didn't like. <laughs> it was of a very specific time where, and you know, obviously it's his attitude and attitudes are very different back then. But when you look at coverage, like this is the book of the Spanish Civil War. Right. It tells what happens. Like and Old Man of the Sea. Yeah, that's a little different. That one's kind okay. of boring. Okay, you didn't like that. One. Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> it's but that's supposed to be like one of his, you know, um, w- one of the that was the one they made us read in junior high. This like a coming of age mm-hmm. thing. This is this and, and it's way was, shorter. Oh, and and it's tight, right? Who doesn't want you know a nice uh, short, uh, succinct yeah. coming of age? It was also more of an extended metaphor than reaction to the horrors of war around him. Um, right, right. As it was, he was getting into his old age and like, I've I've caught this fish on a line. <laughs> Should I let it go or let it kill me? It was a sanity he was referring to. Oh, was he referring to a sanity? You know, that's the other thing is metaphors. And I was like, just tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> but that's but that's me. And uh, so, I mean, I know that people love, they love, I've tried to read Melville too. And it's also, um, actually I liked Moby Dick. Um, uh, most I had a hard time finishing it. I didn't. I didn't finish it. I finished it in in college or high school or whatever I was assigned to me. But uh, I just started to reread it, and parts of it were actually quite funny and uh, very interesting and stuff like that. But when it when it got on the boat, I was like, 
uh, boat. <laughs> and it's a I, bit more dense. It yeah. Got, yeah, it was just like, then it was all inside people's heads. And the stuff that was on land was actually much more interesting to me. So I think I would, I, I, I'm not saying that I would like Gellerhorn, Gellhorn's uh, fiction, especially not if it's uh, conflicted ladies trying to deal with super egotistical dudes, maybe, uh, <laughs> which might be her life. Oh, yeah. But so, so she, she was writing from like 19, what, 28 from when she was 20. Oh, yeah. Uh, basically her whole entire life. And then she was actually, uh, after World War II ended, uh, the same year she divorced Hemingway in 1945, she was one of the first reporters into a Dachau concentration camp. Oh, my God. Um, and that was one of the things she actually said kind of broke her spirit. She, up until that point, had optimism for the human race. And after that... And weirdly enough, the people who lived through Dachau... Uh, had more optimism mm. than her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she was like, yeah, it was shitty to look at that. Uh, what about the people who died there? Anything? No? Oh, you're good. And But, I mean, it could very easily... I don't I don't know. Like, I've never wanted to go. Like, I've been to... T- <laughs> I, I've never wanted to tour. I, I get it, you know? But uh, that I probably should want to. Like, I went to Monticello, and we did the slave tour. Uh-huh. And that was a punch in the face. And... Um, <laughs> I I also don't want to go to that attic in Amsterdam. Oh, I just did that like a year and a half ago. And was it and was it enormously powerful? Yes, I was. Everybody has to be quiet the whole time, and you're in the kind of treadmill line. You have to stay on this path, and no one's talking, and it's all very dim and dark and tiny. And right. I was definitely doing some silent tears. Yeah, the whole time. Yeah. Stuff like that is... I, I wanted to do that because uh, I did think it was kind of important for me. Like, I also kind of do identify with Anne Frank a little bit because she she wanted to be a journalist, too. Right, right. Her whole goal in life <laughs> was to be a journalist. Do you read a lot of books about people who are journalists? You're like, look what they did. <laughs> they, I, would, I don't know why uh-huh, you wouldn't. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's, uh, it gives you that courage to... You know, I'm like, I'm not crazy for feeling so different than normal people. And That's there neat. are ways to stick to your guns and do what you do and do it well. Mm-hmm. I know comedy's no concentration camp or anything. No. But <laughs> I... No, it's not being trapped in an attic with your whole family. But... it. I mean, the thing is, is, I mean, that's why representation is so important. Like, having this woman... must She must have been a, a beacon of hope for any number of young women who wanted to... Oh, absolutely. And she never stopped. Like, she, even after all that, uh, divorced Hemingway uh, in her 60s and 70s, even, she was covering Vietnam and Israel Palestine and Central wow. American civil wars. Like, what the? I, there's no way I'm going to be doing that. <laughs> right. Is she <laughs> walking slowly <laughs> around um, the Sandinistas? What's happening? I, I can't, I have no idea. And then, like, in her 80s, the U.S. invasion of Panama, in her 80s. She dashes off to Panama uh, like, or slowly goes to Panama. Right. <laughs> and then wanders around Rolled and goes. Her, her walker through was Panama. Was she still interviewing the people, like how it affected the people? Yeah. That's what, that was always her. She found what worked and, and yeah. what she enjoyed and what, what she needed to do. Well, I think it was. What was compelled to do. It's, I think those are more important, those stories, kind of, because. You know, you want to hear, like, we all watch the, you know, the Sands of Iwo Jima and the the different war movies and whatever. And you're like, take that hill, fight that fight, do that thing. And, and those are the, and the, and the warriors are all, you know, those are the, most of the movies are about the warriors. But the real pathos and the real, of the cost to humanity that the war is needs a, so much to be revealed. Yeah. It's neat. It's, people they, are, like, humanity is the reason well, th- theoretically, if we're excluding money, uh, <laughs> humanity Let's. is why you know, preserving, <laughs> you know, human life, I guess. I'm, I'm saying this completely wrong, but that's supposedly what war is about, protecting people. Oh, freedoms and, and uh, uh, you know, if we don't well, dive usually, too deep into it. I, well, I never did. I, I mean, you know, like they always say that World War II was like the one just war. Mm-hmm. And there was definitely, I mean... Yes, yes, punch a Nazi, knock yourself out. But um, it's, there's always, 
there's always this underlying, you know, kind of, because every, so does every other war is not a just war. Then it's only about, you know, the warlord trying to control some particular part of a country or we need their oil Mm -hmm. or that, that, that chieftain, you know, you can go down to like, like just sort of more village level where you're like, no, I I want that stuff that you guys have. And then it's money. Yeah. And then it's at a certain point, the causes are almost irrelevant because they keep happening. It's happening, and here's what's happening on the ground. And if you're like, yes, this Nicaragua dictator did X, Y, Z, you're like, yeah, well, he's a jerk. But if it's and we like, got to get rid of him. Yeah, but if we're looking at a million people are having a lot of trouble because of this, right? It's so weird to me that you're like, well, if if Pinochet is so bad. And he needs to be removed, and I believe that. Uh, just a little back up. Going to take a stand, you guys. Pinochet was an ass. Uh, so, um, but th- the people that supported Pinochet are they lemmings or are they just as evil? Like, there's Hitler, and the people who supported Hitler are they? You know, some of them clearly just as evil. Some of them followers and weak and use their powers for evil. And so you're just like, because it's always like, well, why don't we just go get that one guy and then get him out of there? And then we don't have to have a war. We can just put in someone nice. Or there. Can't we just do, do, we have the technology at this point, don't we? Like we all have telephones. Can't we just call someone? And I mean, we live in a country right now where there's trouble, right? <sighs> Surely got trouble. I right here in River City. Right here in River City. Capital T. Times with P. Stands for pool. That stands for pool. <laughs> uh, Missouri's coming through, <laughs> and uh, so, but the um, but yeah, I mean, but I I don't know. It's what what did she have anything to say about the nature of war? Basically, it's horrible, right? And you know the it's always gonna hurt people. Like there's no cause that can be. I don't know. If you fight a just war, quote unquote just yeah. war, uh, there are still going to be repercussions and costs. Right. And people, no matter how good the cause, are going to die. Right. And and decent and innocent people. And innocent people. Just like, and mostly innocent people. But so what, like, did she ever write like an autobiography? She did do, uh, my favorite book that she ever did uh it's kind of a memoir yeah yeah uh travel stories uh called travels with myself and another and it was kind of horror stories where (laughs) stuff went awry um like she's going to china and there's mosquitoes and uh tigers and then the boat springs a leak and the chinese government like throws her in this holding cell for a day and blah 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 Mm -hmm, Uh, and it's mm -hmm. actually the only thing of hers that i've read that's kind of funny Okay. She actually has a sense of humor about herself and her predicament and makes fun of people. Hemingway is one of the characters. Okay. And one of them who she refers to as unwilling companion <laughs> or UC for short. And just talks about him complaining and being drunk and... and complaining and yeah, then being drunk. And repeating the pattern. <laughs> and, uh, that's actually, you know, where I'd suggest if most, most people start... So you kind of get a sense of... Travel Companions by by Martha Gellhorn. Uh, travels with myself and another. Travels with myself and yeah. another. Yeah. Um, you know, China, Russia, Greece. Um, so it kind of... It's, it's traveling and you're meeting and talking to people. And it's also kind of funny. Right. So, they're, But they're, they're personal. It's, it's like a... You know how everybody writes memoirs now. Mm-hmm. So it's like that. Like a series of essays about going different places and... And the and the stuff that happened, yeah, yeah, that sounds kind of fascinating. Yeah, I, I'd highly recommend that as a starting place. And then, maybe what about? This... Yeah, what about this one? The, I mean, it's called a twentieth century twentieth century life. The, the who wrote this? Uh, this is a woman named Caroline Moorhead, uh, whose family is also from St. Louis. What? Uh, she actually has written about. Uh, I should have looked up a little. Is bit Missouri more empty? What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> Of intelligence. <laughs> Wait a minute. <clears throat> uh, uh, so, <laughs> what are we talking about? Hobby Lobby? Okay. Uh, yeah. 
she uh caroline moorhead the author of this uh biographies that written about a lot of other powerful women uh who i did not think to look up before this interview okay but she she has several books yes and she does and this is kind of a theme she kind of picks a because i've never heard of martha gellhorn it's um she seems fascinating oh yes and then she didn't even oh well well i'll just wrap it up her life uh with another little tidbit that i always appreciated that yeah, yeah. Uh, when she was 89 years old uh, living in London and too blind to read anymore because, you know, reading was kind of her only joy at that point. She went and killed herself because she was done with it. She was tired, couldn't run off to Panama anymore. Really? Took uh, How Hemingway of her? <laughs> what on earth? How did she kill herself? Uh, I just know a pill. So I, cyanide, maybe? Oh, it had to be a very strong one or, pill. Yeah, yeah. She had gotten it from a doctor oh. and had planned it. What year was that? What year did she die? Well, this... <laughs> well, I suppose 89. I could do the math. 19, 1908. So, as I'm reading this book the first time... Yes. And I'm going through it and freaking out. Like, I think this... I might be the reincarnation of this woman. <laughs> I'm pre- I think she's in my head and my body, and I'm starting to get freaked out here. Because the similarities just getting inside her mind are insane. It really you do, really resonates. <laughs> they with you. hit home a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but as it turned out, uh, so she ended up uh, in in ninety eight. Okay. Uh, this would have been, and it was nine days before my eighteenth birthday. Okay. <laughs> she killed herself. So maybe that's still some cosmic math. Sure. But I guess I'm not her reincarnation after all. Right. You are not the Dalai Lama either. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. You can be your own person. It still definitely was amazingly inspiring and provides a lot of courage and if she can do it under those insane conditions with no internet and toilets and 1908 in bullets and just and just telling people to take a hike and she's gonna go to paris and yeah and she's gonna wander around the country and does she have um does she have suggestions like there's so many questions in my head and none of them are coming out. So it's, I will say this is that what was her, um, I wonder about her safety. Does she talk about that at all? That, that she ever had any real problems with what had happened or she had this mantra. Okay. And it did end up as a title of one of her works. I can't remember exactly which one, uh, it was called nothing ever happens to the brave. Wow. And, I kind of interpret that to mean, you know, it's it's that whole sticks and stones may break, blah, blah. But yeah. it's in your head. You can't let anything get inside your head. If, what, if you're doing what you love and aren't letting people hold you back or tell you what to do, then you're living your life to the fullest. You might die, but that kind of doesn't Matter. mean you failed. Right, right. <laughs> What, uh, if you nothing, die, what is it? Nothing ever happens to the brave. Nothing ever happens to the brave. In a, that is a fascinating. That's kind of like to that effect, right? Right, but that's kind of an old. That's an awesome old sort of feminist attitude. Of well, it's not going to help to talk about it. Just keep so moving. just keep going. Yeah, just you don't keep stop. going. Don't stop. And if, you if find some, yourself dead one day, right? Then then you'll worry about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. You can't. Right. If you get attacked, hesitate. if if there's some sort of trouble, right? If you get in a bad situation, if you win, you live through it. If you don't live through it, it's not going to matter. And if you live through it, what's it going to help to relive it? Except for the fact that now we have this whole new attitude that the Me Too thing, right? Where you're like, because other people think. Because there's, there's, I love that attitude of nothing ever happens to the brave. Just keep plugging along, right? But there's also people who get paralyzed because they're like, this has never happened to someone else. And I want to shake those people. But that doesn't, that's not going to help them either. Uh, <laughs> so somewhere in between nothing ever happens to the brave and Did, I'm the only one that ever got punched in the ear, uh, you know, and then extra- turn that into whatever sexual abuse you'd like. But um, the but somewhere in between those two things, it's your life. You gotta. There's I mean, no way of knowing what it, you can't not be a woman. Well, you, you can not be a woman these days. But um, you know what? Do you you can't trade lives. You can't start over. 
You just have to do your thing Mm -hmm. to from your gut. Right. Oh yeah. You, uh, but I, I was never raised to not do that. I mean, I, it was always like, do whatever you want because I'm going to make fun of you anyway. Yeah, I did. So it didn't matter. I didn't quite have that. You didn't. Yeah, most, <laughs> well, that's the thing is most people didn't. Right. Like, I feel to some extent very lucky. Uh, I also feel very lucky about the amount of neglect of my parents. Uh, I have met so many women whose mothers are hands on, give a shit about their marital status and their child status and their job status. My parents were like, as long as you don't ask for money, I hope it all works out. And uh, they've never cared. And uh, I used to be mad about it, but I don't, I'm not mad about it anymore because I've watched people give up dreams because their mom's dreams wanted, like, I have a friend of mine whose mom really wanted her, my friend to have children. My friend never wanted children. She wanted to be an actress. She now lives not in Los Angeles acting. She is a stay-at-home mom to two children. I know. And she's like, and it's not that I don't love my children. I do love my children because they're, they're my children. And I guess you end up loving them, but that's nothing that she wanted to do. And so I feel like there's, I want to help those people. Like I want to shake those people and go, fuck everyone. Just do the thing you want to do. And you know, it shouldn't hurt anybody. And if somebody's trying to guilt you into doing the thing, like if someone says, it's, I mean, my, my, my parents were always like, as long as you have a job job and you aren't asking me for money, you can be a forest ranger. You can go forth into the world and learn origami. Do whatever you need to do. And um, and now they're proud of the things that I've achieved. And to some extent, my father believes uh, he was responsible for it. Ha. And I was like, you're going to take credit for this? He's like, I would take credit, but what if you fail next? And <laughs> It's like, well, at this point, I've been in it so long that... Uh, I can't fail. I've already succeeded. Like if, <laughs> if I failed tomorrow, like if I don't do, get to work anymore, I still think it all worked out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Like you, you've been doing this for 15 years, by the way, Julie Seba, S E A B A U G H dot com. And it's at Julie Seba on all the things, right? Yes. The things, the things being Twitter and Instagram and all the things. Okay. Facebook. Oh, yes. Okay. So yeah, like you've been doing this for 15 years. My parents still have no idea what I do. And they do want the grandkids pretty bad. Pretty bad? Don't they have your brother? <laughs> yes, they do. Um, the, and he's got the name. He's got a lot of pressure. Sure. And he's him, right there. Which he kind of is starting to resent. <laughs> uh, he, uh, right. That's between him and his God. <laughs> You're which like, they do share. And that's another, that's a whole other, yeah. That's a whole other thing. So are there other, any, any other fun facts? You uh, the, the too soon did remind me. Yeah, there's, there's, there are some other less fun facts. <laughs> uh, well, we all have them. You know, along, along the life journey, she accidentally killed a kid when he ran out in front of her car in Africa. What? <laughs> she had a kid with her car in Africa? She, she did. She had ovarian and liver cancer. Here's a doozy. Wait, she, how can you move on from she killed a kid in Africa? What country in Africa? I don't remember. Okay. At the uh, it was at one point when she lived there, because she lived everywhere. Did she? How long did she live in Africa? Uh, probably about two years. She bounced around every two years or so. Okay. Like I did. <laughs> Are, how long have you lived in Los Angeles? Uh, this time I'm in, a, I'm in a little over three years. I think I'm finally settled down. It's been like four times in New York and twice in LA and Vegas and Vegas. Oh yeah. How was that? It got bored kind of quickly. Yeah, yeah. Vegas is boring unless you want to go look at noodly ladies and um, gamble. You quickly do not want to have to go to the strip. No, Ever again. I'm sure you're like parking alone. And, uh, so did you do, co- did you cover comedy in Las Vegas? I did. Um, and I did other stuff for Las Vegas weekly. Uh, I was there. Yeah. Two years. Um, but had, uh, I, I did Doug Stanhope's first magazine cover in the United States. He had a, he had a UK GQ cover before that, but, uh, UK GQ, he was on the cover of GQ. Yes. In the, in the UK. UK? Yes, he was. You know, he was just on the dork for us talking about leisure suits. <laughs> I, uh, I assume he was wearing either I'm a Joe shocked. Namath or a Joe, um, a Johnny Carson. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, because those, because they're all vintage, his yes, leisure yes. suits from eBay. Um, so what was the cover that you got for him in Vegas? Uh, this was when he was doing his Death Valley parties and he kind of as a joke ran for president. Oh, yeah, In 2007. Yeah. yeah. 
on the libertarian ticket. Not really, but kind of, but not mm-hmm. at all. Not at all. And I went out into the desert and met all those nuts and wrote about it. <laughs> and that's, and I, you know, I've known him. I've been down to Bisbee since. And, uh, what, but what was the magazine that he was on the cover of? Uh, Las Vegas Weekly. And so they, the, so you, the editors liked your article so much. They're like, we're going to make this the cover. Or did you know going there that it was going to be a cover? Uh, I believe it was confirmed to be the cover beforehand. Okay. Uh, assuming he ended up being photogenic enough. Fair enough. Sure. Yeah. And so that's that. So you uh, wrote for the Las Vegas Weekly. You worked as an intern for Book What in New York? Uh, b- book Magazine. There was a magazine about books at one point. Sure. And in a different time and place. And, uh, they yeah. still got them. They still got <laughs> yeah. them. It's still happening. Uh, I've done. Uh, yeah. What was your first paid? writing uh like uh it was dave attell for las vegas weekly uh i started freelancing for him when i lived in new york before they hired me uh to do more stuff uh yeah sort of as a as a publicist like to help that's freelance stuff dave attell himself hired you no 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 they hired me to do a dave attell piece oh fair enough that got turned around on me sorry about that um yeah he came and did a show at the university of missouri my final semester my extra semester there and i was like oh this is a new thing because i was not aware of comedy at that point in time having was he the first comic that you ever saw or i think i'd been to the deja vu in columbia missouri a couple times but it was hacky and lame and not inspiring and then when i saw a tell i was like oh this is art oh it can be (laughs) oh yes and no one was writing about it Mm -hmm. in any really significant way at that point it was always just lumped in like calendar music listings and i mean people write about music and film but why was nobody writing about comedy right and so i was like i'm gonna do that (laughs) so how many how many words was the david tell piece have you have you posted that that was my first one that i did this month on this month yeah oh excellent and I've since, uh, yeah, I'm posting like, a bunch like of stories. Today's like the, what is it, the eighth? Sure. So you've posted eight different stories that, that, that you wrote in the beginning. What what are some of the ones you, I don't know if you can remember them all, but what are the, some of the ones that you uh, Today I posted writing about the 20th anniversary of the state reuniting at Festival Supreme in 2014. Okay. For Rolling Stone. Oh, that's neat. I did Amy Schumer for the cover of Variety. Wow. I did uh, kind of just a little personal uh, recommendation preference. I did Improvised Shakespeare for LA Weekly. Okay. I think everybody should see Improvised Shakespeare. Okay. And that's here in Los Angeles? Uh, They have, I want to say, monthly or quarterly or something like that at Largo. Oh, it's a, uh, it's a, is it a podcast? It's, as well? uh, it is literally, as the name implies, a group Imp- of dudes improvising Shakespearean comedy. Th- it's Thomas Middleditch. Okay. And they often have special guests like, like Patrick thrill- Stewart. Like Thrilling Adventure, essentially, but it's improvised Shakespeare. And, it, and, it's at, and that used to be over at Largo as well. And so if you go to Largo, it's like either once a month or once a quarter or something like that. But do they ever record it and put it out on the on the interwebs? I think so. I think I might be wrong. It might just that. be a live experience. Yeah. And you've been to a lot of that? Have you yeah. been to several of them? Because um, it sounds it's hilarious. Been a lot of festivals. Oh, they have met festivals? Then, yeah. Montreal was, they had a huge year at Montreal one year, whatever, a long time ago. But uh, yeah, just basically gonna have all kinds of stuff uh like i did a marin thing for gq that's coming up i did a whole history of comedy central for the av club that's coming up what uh, nice work i just got my first playboy byline julie seba is doing well you guys <laughs> it's all coming together and uh just 15 years and but the thing is you've been plugging along the whole time and so you'll get something kind of fancy and then what's what have you had to do bread and butter wise like is there is there just like I got to cover the what's happening at the Laugh Factory in Chicago, and it's some shouty wiggly dude. <laughs> and uh, There's certainly been a lot of that. There's been a fair number of that. I, um, and there were also a lot of, you know, counter to what I kind of said a little bit earlier, a lot of calendar blurbs. Okay. <laughs> writing about comedy. Right, just in a way to that, try to keep it together. Yeah, uh, that nobody else was going to be doing, so I might as well be doing it and getting a minuscule paycheck for. Right, right, because those add up. 
It's uh, I just did a gig uh, for a hundred dollars, and I told the guy, I said, I'm only doing this because one day I'm going to need a hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah, and so I'm going to take the hundred dollars now, so you don't forget about me. And he was like, Fair enough. Yeah, get on stage. I did mm. kind of run into, and I this was part of my Amy Schumer cover variety post from yeah. the other day. Uh, 2003 started getting re or t- t- 2013. Okay, 2013. Uh was a phase where it was kind of getting really hard and everything was plateauing and geez, the mental stuff starting to swim around in the head and the antidepressants and that sort of stuff. And then I had uh, the Schumer variety cover kind of just fall into my lap. Okay. Thanks to some recommendations from some very nice people. Sure. And that started opening a lot more doors and I've been kind of okay since then. Yeah. I've, had to do less and less of stuff I don't want to do and which is pick and choose really telling what I want to about comedy, which is less about like the jokes of here is a joke that was said Mm -hmm. and people (laughs) laughed out loud and more about (laughs) like the context in which this comedy was created and the stories behind the people creating it and what it actually means going out into the world. I'm all about context of comedy. Sure. Much like uh, Gellhorn and the context of war. So it's the same. It's the same, but of course, <laughs> nothing alike. Uh, the stakes are so much lower. I cannot express. Yeah, but um, I'm not going to get no postage stamp like she did, or have Nicole Kidman play me in a lousy HBO movie or anything. She has a postage stamp, and a, she, and Nicole yeah. Kidman played her in a lousy HBO she, movie. Yeah, I because you know I kind of tried to be active in my dorkdom. Right. Uh, oh, you looked up stuff. Yeah. I, I went at some point to her St. Louis. I tracked down her old address mm-hmm. when she was a kid in her school. Okay. And I went and like, sat out in front of them in my car and took a picture of the exterior <laughs> and thought deep thoughts. And Sure, sure. She, uh, there's a St. Louis Walk of Fame where they have stars on Del Mar Vol- Boulevard, their entertainment kind of loop there. And she at one point did not have a star. Okay. Like, what the hell? And I wrote in their little form and suggested it. Like, how dare you? She had already had a stamp by that point. Right, right. Uh, she did finally get her star. Okay. Uh, and and you, you were you were probably helpful I to that. <laughs> uh, I'm sure Caroline Moorhead, the author, probably had a lot more to do with it than me. You, uh, you never know. <laughs> you never know. So do you have up? So you have an upcoming thing. Clearly, you said. I think it's the, a Playboy byline. I just get my first one. I'm doing another one. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't want to jinx it. I'm not going to say it. Maybe, okay. maybe it'll fall through. Well, what was the last one? Uh, that was Russell Peters was, was the first Playboy byline I got. Canadian comic? Couple, yes. Canadian, I don't know anything Indian. Ab- about um, uh, uh, show business. I'm he, so sorry. <laughs> he has a he has done a lot of acting. He has? Uh, he has not. Okay. Uh, but he had a Netflix show come out called The Indian Detective, which I didn't bother really watching because I don't care that much about TV. Right. Sides. That's not your stand-up thing. Stand-up comedy because there's a billion people writing about it. Right. I'm not going to put anything unique on it. Uh, but I went to the Ice House. No, the uh, Comedy Magic. I went to Comedy Magic and saw his new set he was working on for his new tour that starts later this month and going to 36 countries and kind of more talked about that. And at Comedy and Magic, did he do a long set? Yeah, it was like over two hours. Oh, my God. No, no. <laughs> he does a lot uh, of crowd work, that Russell Peters. Oh, does he? Okay. Yeah, there's a All bit right. of that. I love the idea of the Indian detective. I like the name. It really speaks to me. Uh, I think I know what I'm going to watch. I'm not sure it did that. I'm well. going to. It's going to be about a detective who happens to be of Indian ancestry. Is that the deal? Is he Canadian though? Like, did he? Yes. Was he born in Canada? He's from Toronto. Okay. Uh, everybody is at this point staring disbelievingly at their <laughs> uh, iPads. He's qu- he's quite large. Yeah, he's a big deal. It's, yeah, I know his name. I just don't know his deal. And I would not have necessarily written about this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because I did, a lot of people do write about Russell Peters. Uh, oh, right, right. But I was like, well, I, and I was going to be the only one who got to talk to him in person. Other people got to talk to him on the phone. So I'm like, well, that's kind of cool. And I can go to Comedy Magic and it could be my first byline for Playboy. So yeah, I'm going right, to right. Yeah, yeah. You'll take the assignment because it's got all the good things attached to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I got to play Carnegie Hall with Brian Regan this yeah, last did. year. And I was like, 
I don't want to do stand-up comedy in Carnegie Hall. It doesn't look like it's really made for stand-up comedy. It's made for orchestras. But uh, it turns out I get to open for Brian Regan and I get to do Carnegie Hall. Uh, those are both two things that uh, someone gives a shit about and I should probably too. And then I got paid. Yeah, so, so when all... you weigh the whole like, I'm making an artistic compromise <laughs> for what are people going to say? Well, they're going to say you played Carnegie Hall. That's all they're going to say. That's all they're going to say. And, uh, and at one point someone had to, someone said to me, um, the last person who said, are you excited about playing Carnegie Hall? Because uh, I said, Here's you got a choice right here. I can either do stand up comedy or I can be excited about doing Carnegie Hall. I cannot do both. Uh, I have to pretend that it's not Carnegie Hall and do stand up comedy, or I can just stand there for fifteen to twenty minutes, basking in the chandelier light. Uh, how about I don't? <laughs> how about I do stand up because that's what I was hired to do? Anyway, it's Sometimes a weird. Sometimes you gotta hide out in that medical strip bathroom. That's it. I love the idea. Uh, I would like to know more. I wonder if Caroline Moorhead listens to the Dork for us. She might. We don't know. <laughs> I forgot one fun fact. Less, Please. Less fun. Uh, one less fun <laughs> fact. On this closing note, Martha Gellhorn also got raped when she was 79 or 80. <laughs> See? Me I too. T- Hashtag me too. Hashtag- the end. And so that's what we know about Martha Gellhorn. <laughs> Check her out. <laughs> here's the thing. Uh, things don't happen to the brave. <laughs> that's what I was asking. Like, does, I mean, the thing is, is she's in war zones. She's in the middle of nowhere with no one and unprotected by herself. Was that the first time she was raped? Uh, to public knowledge. And it was, uh, how did it come out? At her, at one of her many homes. Uh, she had a place on, again, there's, I can't keep track of everything of where she was at what point in time. Right, right. Cause even at 89, she's moving every two years. Which she had, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, she had a place by some beach somewhere and she was walking down some stairs to her beach and, right. oh, there's a dude. And, uh, proof positive, uh, that it's not about sex, you guys, it's about power. So, uh, uh, on that cheerful note, <laughs> Julie Siva. Sorry. Uh, that's fine. It's uh, you've done vital work here. It's important um, for it's it's part of her story, and she did overcome it, and it didn't stop her, and you know, she did kill herself nine years later, but it was because of reading, not because of that. Right, and it was nine years later, not nine days later. It was because um, the thing is, is is she is proof positive that you can survive all of these things, like walking into Daco. I, I mean, that you said that that broke her. I mean, she obviously recovered and found some hope and found some, some, she was like, because when you witness something, something that horrible, I can't imagine, um, that it's easy to get over it. So well, certainly your perspectives are going to shift with horrible things happening to you or seeing terrible things in life. Mm-hmm. But again, it's like, well, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to write about them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's what she did. And or she sounds fascinating. Or make comedy about them, which is what everybody's doing now. And uh, as long as it's funny, you guys, let there be punchlines. And uh, so uh, as someone who has a joke about the genocide, let's definitely make sure there's always a punchline. <laughs> uh, so uh, Julie Sebo, it's juliesebaugh.com. S-E-A-B-A-U-G-H. Julie is spelled like Julie. It's at Julie Seba on all the things. And thank you so much for doing the show. Thank you, Jackie. I, yeah, I'm glad I could promote myself one time before <laughs> going back into a five-year hibernation. Exactly. You won't be able to find her, you guys. And Rangers, you know the rules out there. Take care of each other. My hat, my hat, my hat. They're dancing around my hat. <laughs> my hat, my hat, my hat. Well, what do you think of that? If it looks like a Mexican hat dance and it sounds like a Mexican hat dance, it's most likely a Mexican hat dance. So take off your hat and let's dance. Yay! Oh my god. Thank we you. why don't we just call that as the end of the show?